the New Testament lesson on this Pentecost Sunday, the year of our Lord 2020, is in the um, Acts of the Apostles, a familiar story to many of us, uh, but one which keeps uh, getting a breath of fresh air blown uh, upon it as the world we live in keeps changing. Acts chapter 2, beginning at 1, hear the word of God. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages. We hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, ha, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. They were all together in one place. That's kind of been our default image ever since. For the church, we think of the church as the gathered together body, congregating in one place. And so on Sunday mornings at the appointed time, local communities of people make their little pilgrimage from their respective homes to their houses of worship. We sing our songs, say our prayers, engage the word of God, participate in the sacraments and follow up with conversations over cups of coffee. And it's a distinctively corporate activity, not a solitary event. There's something about the fellowship. We are a communion of saints. They were all together in one place. Perhaps the reason that has become our default image for the church is because we've stopped reading the story from that point going forward, or at least stopped paying serious attention from then on. And who can blame us? 
because it's actually a rather attractive image. There's something really nice sounding about it. We like being together in one place. But if we're honest, there's a little more to it than just that. We much prefer being with people who are like us and more so than people who are different from us. When I was called to help organize this church 23 years ago this summer, I, had, um, I didn't have much more than a clue as to how to go about getting started. And so I was given a book about church planting and I read it. Um, and one of the things that was recommended in the book was to leverage something called the homogeneous unit principle. If you're not familiar, it's a phenomenon that, uh, that says that people much prefer to associate with other people who are similar in their looks and their beliefs and their social status as themselves. And so the easiest way to start a new church, actually the easiest way to start any kind of new organization, is to identify and target a certain demographic of the population and then the people who naturally uh, fit into that will come and be a part of it. They'll be drawn to it. The homogeneous unit principle makes really good sociological sense. However, it makes terrible theological sense. Pentecost reveals to us, among other things, that God has no affection whatsoever for the homogeneous unit principle. What God really likes is diversity. Now watch this. Up until the second chapter of Acts, Israel considered herself to be the one holy chosen nation identified by God to be a special distinct people, descendants of Abraham, remember, who uh, with whom God had made a um, kind of a special pact, um, a covenant. It's impossible to miss this if you read the Old Testament. Even after the Babylonians, um, around 587 BC, came in, invaded and destroyed Jerusalem, there remained a deep corporate sense that they were an exceptional people because God had essentially said, of all the ethnic groups in the world, you're the pick of the litter. I choose you. And so they had this deep sense of exceptionalism. Uh, but the kingdom of God is moving in. And the gospel says that God so loved the cosmos, the whole world, that he sent the Son. And in the sending of the Son, what we see in Jesus is that he disrupted pretty much everything, especially this mindset of exceptionalism because he didn't behave like an Orthodox Jew, didn't follow many of the customs or obey some of the rules. For example, he shocked people in the ways that he dignified women, the ways that he dined with known sinners, the ways that he touched the untouchables, the way that he got down on the floor and played with children. And once, when he was trying to describe what being a neighbor looks like, he chose a Samaritan, the ethnic enemy to the Jews, as his model for what neighborly love looks like. In other words, he was forever mixing things up, defying religious rules, demolishing social barriers, and in the process, offending a lot of polite people. This, I wish to point out to you, is what happens when the kingdom of God moves in and displaces empire. It's a liberating breath of fresh air to the poor and the marginalized. But it's an unwelcome intrusion to the powerful and the socially privileged. And so it's little surprise when we hear dismissive comments directed at Jesus. He has a demon. He's working for the devil. He's a blasphemer. 
he's going to try to overturn the government. He's going to unravel the fabric of the religious establishment. We have to get rid of him. Whenever there is a major disruption to the status quo, accompanied by dismissive comments, chances are good that the kingdom of God is shaking things up. This is what happened on Pentecost, a day that celebrated the giving of the law with a sound like the rush of wind, with a sight of tongues of fire, and with the cacophony of at least 15 different voices, languages. The Jewish festival was forever disrupted. In other words, you have to see this. What was once carved in stone was given a breath of fresh air. And just as quickly came the dismissive comments. They're filled with new wine. They're just drunk. Can we please get back to the law? God's disruptions are like wind and like fire. They blow things away and they blow things up. They send our assumptions skittering and they burn away the superfluous, leaving behind something much more refined and pure, good and right. It occurs to me that the current global pandemic is having a similar effect upon us. These are days in which that default image of the church has been disrupted. We are not altogether in one place. And that is, I believe, a really good thing. We are being forced into practicing the reality that we can be together as the church without being gathered in one place. While we are no longer together in one place, we are together in one spirit. These are days that are disrupting some other things as well, which is also, I believe, a good thing. What we now know is that we have been visited by a cosmic pandemic. A virus has moved into the world and it has invaded essentially every inhabited part of it. It's a virus that is no respecter of boundary lines. It does not discriminate according to ethnicity or gender or class. Which is to say, there doesn't appear to be any favorite children among us that God is offering special protection. The United States of America might indeed be special but it is not exceptional. Otherwise, I doubt we would be hosting nearly one-third of the world's COVID-19 cases. So, what do we do when we are faced with such massive disruption? We turn to the scriptures. We lend our ears to Peter, who stood up and spoke up in the wake of chaos. Now notice that Peter didn't do anything terribly original. He simply echoed the prophetic words of Joel. Hear them again. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall uh, prophetuo is the word. They will prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Now, one of the great gifts that we were given during the 16th century Protestant Reformation was a recovery of the biblical notion of the priesthood of all believers. The idea is that you, if you are a believer in Jesus, you have priestly agency. You don't need to go to special schools. You don't need to have, uh, be ordained to a certain office or to have um, some holy sounding titles in front of your name. Nope, if you're baptized, you're a priest. 
You have all the authority necessary to mediate the grace of God to other people right up to and including forgiving their sins. The priesthood of all believers. But that's only half of the calling that has been given to us. The other half shows up here in Acts 2 on Pentecost as a fulfillment of Joel. In addition to being in the priesthood of all believers, we are also among the prophethood of all believers. Here's the basic stuff you need in order to get started. Prophets of old had a fairly consistent message, it turns out, in the face of massive disruption to the world that they were both living in and speaking into. Walter Brueggemann has helped me to see the three main assignments that prophets both then and now have been given, and I've used them as the title of the sermon just to kind of help remind you of these urgent tasks. They are reality, grief, and hope. Let me just add a little comment to each one of them, beginning with reality. What is true? What's real? It's a question because truth has fallen on hard times, and we've become so accustomed to distortions of the truth and flat-out lies that we no longer have any level of confidence believing anything or anyone. Truth gets distorted by our leaders in both the society and in the church, leaving many of us feeling cynical. But even more than that, there are, quite frankly, some things we have come to believe about ourselves that are simply not true. This is going to offend some of you, but the United States is not the greatest country on earth, and it is not God's chosen nation. Israel used to hold claim to that, but no more. Here's the truth. In Christ, we have been gathered into a new community, a new Israel, citizens of God's kingdom that knows no borders, that favors no people group, and shows no partiality. That's reality. Grief is the second one. The second task of a prophet is to grieve with people who are suffering loss or who are simply themselves lost. Prophets give voice to the loss, naming it, lamenting it, and then coming alongside the suffering and the sad ones in acts of solidarity. When there is loss of life and loss of livelihood, there needs to be room for grief. And who among us needs to be reminded that there's a whole lot of loss being suffered right now. Among the many things that deeply grieves me, as I know it does many of you, is that we are still dealing with the insidious sin of racism. What kind of a world is it that says, at least with its behavior, that black lives don't matter? I can tell you it's not a biblically informed world. Because according to the scriptures, Christ has abolished those categories of humanity. The social classes and pecking orders do not exist in the kingdom of God. They should not exist in this world. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh is the biblical word. Not white flesh, not masculine flesh, not American flesh all flesh. COVID-19 is the event that revealed to the world that God has no favorite children because no one is inoculated from the virus. Some years later, the Apostle Paul fleshes this out, writing, I love this, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Until that vision is realized, 
we've got some serious grief work to do. And then hope. Present circumstances are not permanent. What we are living now is not the end of the story. Because God is a redeemer, there's always a good reason to be hopeful. And so we find fresh ways to speak and to live hopefully in response to the considerable despair and the broken systems of this world that they so often evoke. To be a Pentecost people is to be a people of hope. It has a way of buoying us up, lifting us above the commotion, giving us a view of something bigger, better. But we must be careful what we hope for. For example, aspiring to be, being hopeful to be a great nation is an exercise in futility. Our calling is not to be great. It's to be good. A goodness characterized by people who are spokespersons for truth, who grieve loss and who grieve with those who are at a loss and who maintain a steadfast love in the Lord. Because with a God who is yet in love with this world, hope is perhaps the most reasonable thing we can cling to. There are moments, and this is one of those moments for me right now, I wish I could see your faces. I wish I could look into your eyes and tell you that these are urgent days inviting us to repent from our nationalistic arrogance, from our white supremacy, from our indifference to systemic injustice and for our disregard for the poor. Reality, grief, hope. These are the prophetic tasks required in a season of global disruption. They are not relegated to only the big names with the big voices like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Joel. They are required of everyone upon whom the Spirit of God rests. In the days of Moses, it included some ordinary people like Eldad and Medad. In these days, it includes people like you and me. Speak truth to power. Come alongside people in grief and distress. And never, never give up hope. Reality, grief, hope. These are your prophetic responsibilities for such a time as this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.